Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Welcome to Truth in History. Today I'd like to talk about something rather different than the regular Bible study. In the day and age in which we live, it has become very evident to everyone that has their eyes open that our government has encroached into every crack and cranny of our lives. We are a socialist nation. We are no longer a pure democratic republic. We are a nation in which statism has become the norm. Now, what is statism? Statism is that concept where you give allegiance to the state. And the United States of America, as we all know, is not the country that it was when it was founded in 1776, 1787. It's not the same country that it was in 1950. But how did we become this way? What developed over time to change the minds and the priorities of our politicians and of our social scientist, those that more or less control or determine culture. How did that happen? Well, it's a long story, a very long story. But what I want to do today, I want to take one part just one small piece of history and try to explain it so that our eyes will be open to that little window that was opened in 1861 that is now grown to be something that cannot be stopped. And that is allegiance to the state. What I want to talk about is something that may surprise you, but it's a song entitled The Battle Hymn of the Republic. Who wrote it? What is the history of it? And what is the meaning of it? Now, we are no longer living in a democratic republic. Democracy these days is determined by politicians, however they want to define the term at the moment, considering the circumstances that would be advantageous or disadvantageous to them. But regardless, Politicians, scientists, uh, writers, different people, ministers even, have created a narrative in the minds of people that has become the state is supreme. The state is supreme. But in the Bible, the Bible does not teach that the state is supreme. An empire, as we read the book of Daniel, there were four empires, as we all know. Babylonian, Medo-Persia, Grecian, and Roman. 
And every one of those empires took on, they assumed, the attributes of deity. And the attributes of deity that I'm speaking of, number one is indivisibility. It cannot be divided. You cannot leave it. You cannot secede from it. Otherwise, you're a traitor. Number two is infallibility. The state thinks it's right on everything. On economic issues, political issues, foreign policy, on moral issues like abortion, they determine what is right or what is wrong. On sexual sins, they determine what is right and what is wrong. And they claim infallibility. Our government has claimed infallibility. Some of the Amish that may not have all their milk from their dairy processed the way that the state wants them to have the milk processed. So what does the state do? They take federal agents and they raid the place. And they shut it down. And these people have been operating on their own for hundreds of years without the aid or the advice of the state. But suddenly the state says, your product is no good. It has to be processed right. It has to be licensed, etc." Number three is irresistibility. Irresistibility. Try resisting the federal government. They have unlimited lawyers and unlimited money, and they own the courts. It's like the ranchers in Montana. Try resist them. What do they do? They'll kill you and be justified. Just like they killed that mother and son, 14-year-old son, in Idaho several years ago. Was the agent held responsible? No. The, the mother was holding an infant in her arms. She was no threat to anyone. But they shot her, killed her, and shot the young boy in the back. Who's held responsible? No one. When you can burn down a compound with over a hundred people in it in Texas and get by with it, it shows that the state has assumed the, the attribute of deity of irresistibility. All this, how did we get here? Well, just one little area I want to talk about. And that is the battle hymn of the Republic. But before I do so, I want to read Revelation chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. What that is, that is prophetic language, the language of the prophets, showing an earthquake, a political earthquake, not a physical earthquake, but a cultural, political earthquake. And the sun and the moon representing the authorities of that 
country or that state or that empire. And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth as it was, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Turmoil of nations. And the kings of the earth, the great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of those mountains. Mountains represent kingdoms or empires. All these men took refuge in the state. That's what that means. It doesn't mean that all these men, rich men, bond men, going to run to the Rocky Mountains west of Denver and cry, rocks fall on us. No, they go to the state. When the, mar uh, when the hedge funds collapsed, who bailed them out? The state. Who takes care of your children? The state. Who educates your children? The state. Who takes care of you in Social Security? The state. Medicare. Medicaid. Uh, all these food stamps programs. The state, the state, the state. That's statism. Verse 16, and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, cover us, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. In other words, we don't want to obey the commandments of God. We want the state to cover us. We don't want to obey the Word of God and the commandments of the Lamb. Let the state cover us for the great day of His wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? No doubt every one of us grew up in a most of us, anyway, grew up in a public school. I know I did. And one of the songs that we were taught was the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Now, there are many beautiful, inspiring hymns of the faith and songs of the Christian church. But do we ever stop to think of their history or their meaning? Now, this is called a hymn, but it's not a hymn, not in my language. It's a song. And the history of this song tells us a lot, and especially the person who wrote it. Now, the person who wrote it was Julia Ward Howe. She was a poet that was born in 1819. She died in 1910. And she, was, she came from a family that actually could trace their lineage back to Roger Williams, an early, early American. And her father... Uh, he was a Wall Street banker, and Julia Ward Howe was raised in opulence in her early life, rich family. And they knew all the people that were influential in that day. And in 1861, when the, quote, Civil War started, 
she was in the company of some people that were very liberal. They were socialist. They were borderline communist. And earlier she had married a man by the name of Samuel Gridley Howe. He was a medical doctor. And he was in philanthropy. And he worked at the Institute for the Blind in Boston. And her and her husband, Samuel Gridley Howe, they were involved in the abolitionist movement in the 1840s, 1850s. Abolitionism to abolish slavery. And she was also into women's suffrage. Now, she was a very rebellious woman. She was raised in opulence and then married a man 20 years her senior. Her, I think her mother died early. Her father died early while she was rather young. So she married this man and he was involved in the abolition movement. And they became well known and well connected with what they call the Boston Radical Club. And these people that associated there were men like William Ellery Channing, Thomas Wentworth Higgison, and Theodore Parker. And some of these men became members of what they call uh, the Secret Six. We've all heard of John Brown and the Secret Six. And Samuel Gridley Howe, he helped finance John Brown. Now, he was the radical, wild-eyed, wild-haired, violent, with his sons, abolitionists, that went out to Kansas and killed several people. And then he came back to Harper's Ferry and he tried to start a slave rebellion. And this was in 1859. And the house, Samuel and the author of this song, Julia Ward Howe, they were supporting him theologically, financially, and philosophically. They were supporting John Brown, this murderer. Well, the United States government at the time had to quell that riot. So they sent a young soldier out there by the name of Robert E. Lee, when he was in the U.S. Army, to capture this man. So that tells you the crowd that she hung with. Now, in 1861, when the war had started in April, there were a couple battles later on that year around Washington, D.C., called the Battle of Manassas, number one, the Battle of Manassas, number two. And at one of these battles, a lot of the people that lived in Washington, D.C., went out to watch the fight. It was recreation. They figured the Union Army would just smash those Southern boys, the Confederate Army, and just you know, it would be just like a, a Sunday afternoon in the park. But it didn't happen that way. The Confederate Army fought with everything they had. And it sent a lot of those Union soldiers running back to Washington, D.C. 
and Julia Ward Howe was out there in her buggy and thousands of others and they went back. They went back into the city of Washington, D.C. But the story goes that her pastor, her pastor gave her a suggestion. Why don't you, you're, you're a poet, why don't you write a poem and put it to the words of John Brown's body lies moldering in the grave. That was the song of that day. Now, Julia Ward Howe claims that during the night she had a vision and these words came to her, the words of this song. And you see, the North needed a rallying cry. They needed a battle song to encourage the people and lift their spirits, something that the army band could play as they marched south, invading the, uh, the southern states. They needed a song to, to boost their spirits. So she wrote this hymn, quote, hymn, Actually, it was a poem that she wrote, and it fit the tune of John Brown's body lies moldering in the grave, because that was a popular hymn. And she sold that to the Atlantic uh, Quarterly, and there she got Atlantic Monthly, it was the Atlantic Monthly paper. They paid her four or five dollars for that. And, but Julia Ward Howe herself denounced the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Julia Ward Howe herself denounced the New Testament. In fact, these are the words that she wrote. This is her own statement. Quote, not until the Civil War did I officially join the Unitarian Church and accept the fact that Christ was merely a great teacher with no higher claim to preeminence in wisdom, goodness, and power than many other men. Having rejected the exclusive doctrine that made Christianity and special forms of it the only way of spiritual redemption, I now accept the belief that not only Christians, but all human beings, no matter what their religion, are capable of redemption, unquote. You see, she came from a line of strict Calvinist. They believed the Word of God. They believed the Bible was the Word of God. They believed in the sovereignty of God. They believed in the efficacy of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ once and for all for sin. They believed in salvation by grace through faith. She denounced that. She joined the Unitarian Church. The Unitarian Church to this day, they denounce, they disbelieve in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. That's what Julia Ward Howe believed. So when she saw this army the Union Army out there in great display before Washington, D.C. And her pastor says, why don't you write a poem or a song that could be used as a morale boost 
for the Union Army and the people of the North. She said she had a vision or a dream or something that night. And she got up early in the morning, found some paper and a pencil, and she began to write these words. Now concerning John Brown, John Brown, that murderer, he used biblical language to justify his means. He used biblical phrases because the Bible back then was more widely accepted as it is today. Teachers and poets and, and politicians and philosophers, they used Bible language, even King James language of that day, because it was the popular thing to do, because the people at large were more literate in Scripture than we are today. But this is what she said concerning John Brown after he was hung on the scaffolds. She said, John Brown will glorify the gallows like Jesus glorified the cross. Now, what do you think of a woman that would equate a murderer, John Brown, that went out to Kansas with his sons and slaughtered people, brutality, committed all types of unbelievable violence. And then she make a statement like this, that John Brown will glorify the gallows like Jesus glorified the cross. And she denounced the doctrine of election she said, I now accept the belief that not only Christians, but all human beings, no matter what their religion, are capable of redemption. Folks, many sincere Christians, well-meaning Christians, will sing this song at 4th of July, thinking, man, that's a catchy tune. The words are great, but they have no idea what they, those words mean. They sing those words with zeal and fervor, but no understanding of what they mean. And what this did, this little incident of writing this song, It helped to weld the intentions, the spirit, the purpose, the mind of the people of the North, not everyone, that they were fighting a holy war against the South. Now, I picked up a hymn book and I turn to this hymn. It's called a hymn. I just call it a song. This is what she said. These are some of the words. She said, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. What she meant by that was the vast number of Union soldiers in the North in their uniform and in formation. I have seen the coming. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And he is trampling out the vintage where the wraps the grapes of wrath are stored. In other words, they're going to go down and they're going to crush the South. These were Americans fighting Americans in America. And Lincoln called up 75,000 men 
right at the very beginning of the war, to go down and to invade the South. And this woman puts it in biblical language. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. See, God's terrible swift sword, she is equating to the Union Army. She said, I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps as she looked out over the field of hundreds of tents of the Union Army. She said, I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have built at him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Verse three, he has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul to answer. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. And she's, she goes on to say, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. I didn't know Christ was born among the lilies. With a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. And then she says, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Talking about slavery. This army that I'm looking at. They're going to go and die to make men free, the slaves of the South. And this song, one of the verses mentions the burnished rows of steel. She was looking upon the polished Union cannons. Now, some people may disagree with me on this, but these are the facts. As the Union Army went south for four long years, four long years, very, very few battles were fought in the north. Gettysburg was the most prominent one. But the mass of warfare and the battles that were fought were fought in the south. And the Union Army came in waves. At, six, at one point, Sherman had 60,000 men called bummers marching from Atlanta to Savannah. And in a 60-mile swath, 60-mile wide swath, and he gave them permission to do anything they wanted to do, burn, steal, rape, destroy, burn homes, burn churches, kill, dig up the dead, trying to find family jewels, 
desecrate anything they wanted to, rape women. And the band went before them, marched before them. You can imagine, here comes the Union Army, drum and fife, playing this tune and singing, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. And a lot, history will tell us, a lot of the black slaves were jubilant. They said, our liberators are coming. Our liberators are coming. But when the liberators got close to the slave quarters, what did they do? They went in, they stole whatever they wanted, because some of those slaves had some nice things. Brooches, hat pins, watches. Some of them had silver. Some of them had expensive items. They stole them. They raped the black women. And even in one case, when a lot of the slaves followed the Union Army, <clears throat> they got to the Savannah River. And the, the officer said, what are we going to do with all these people? So they were crossing the river on rafts. And guess what? A lot of those rafts sunk accidentally or on purpose. The people drowned as the army was playing. His truth is marching on. But yet today, 4th of July or some patriotic event, Americans don't get offended when I say this, but seemingly we're the dumbest people on the planet. We're the most deceived people on the planet because public school has taught us all types of lies and we believed it and never questioned it. But I begin to question some things that I've been taught in public school, and this is one of them. Should you sing this song? Should I sing this song? That's your choice. I've made my choice. My choice is negative. I haven't sung it in years. Because I no longer want my mind to be a cesspool, a garbage can of the state and the narratives that they have created over decades in telling us how to think, what to think, and to depend upon the state. So this song is just one item among others that has been put over on the American people through the public school system to believe that the state is right. These days, it's no longer, quote, the Union Army or Lincoln's Army going south, brutalizing the people. 
now we have several three-letter federal agencies. I mean, I, I can't even name them all that are fully armed, that get involved in different investigations of crime or suspected crime. And we're financing these. We've created a police state. And it started in 1861 under a man that most people revere. Most conservatives are in his cult. Most conservative people, most conservative Christians are in the Lincoln cult and believe that he saved the Union. Folks, it was the beginning of the deterioration of the Union. And this was just one example, an example of propaganda, propaganda. Julia Ward Howe was not out on the battlefield, but her words inflamed the army and many of the people of the North, not all of them. But just remember that she denounced the New Testament. She denounced the doctrine of election. She denounced the deity of Jesus Christ. She was Unitarian. She was a socialist. And later on in her life, she became a women's liver. And she associated with all the women lib people of that era. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton was one of them. I, I can't remember all of them, but she associated with those people. And she became one of the leaders. And there you have it. I'd rather sing a song written by a man of God. I'd rather sing a song written by somebody that's been touched by the Holy Spirit rather than singing a song that elevates the state and that is nothing but propaganda to formulate a priority in our minds toward that the government is God. Folks, if God is not your king, I mean that the God of the Bible is not your king. Your king, your earthly king will be your God. And I'm afraid that a lot of Christians, conservative Christians these days, are looking to the state to change things and turn them around. It's not going to happen. The only turnaround we're going to have is when our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, appears among us and overthrows the enemy and sits upon his, the throne of his father David because Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is our prophet, our priest, and our coming king. God bless you.